Hello and welcome into the So Rare Andrews podcast brought to you by Rotowire. I am Andrew Laird, Senior Soccer Editor of Rotowire. With me as always is Andy Black and today a very special guest to join us for the next topic that we wanted to cover. Uh, Andy and I wanted to talk about collectibles for quite some time and we kind of kept putting it off because we weren't quite sure what direction we wanted to go in. And then Andy realized that he had a connection to possibly the best possible guest we could have. And so joining us, those of you who are on YouTube can see this, but uh, joining us is Randy Wassinger, who is the founder and CEO of Crypto Slam, which uh, anybody who is involved with NFTs is certainly familiar with this site. Randy, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Andrew. Super excited to be here. Hope I can, I guess, live up to the hype. of. Uh, so, so this is the best you can do is me? <laughs> oh, please. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. All right. All right. Um, we'll, we'll do our best, I guess. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, we, we've covered a number of topics uh, on these podcasts, and we always kind of end up getting back to collectibles at some point in the conversation. And um, we, we really wanted to get your perspective on a number of things, um, but you just seem to have your, your hand in a lot of, uh, at least your site has your, its hands in a lot of yeah. NFTs and is, allows people to sort of know what they're dealing with. Um, you must have some sort of collectible background. Uh, and I so I was actually curious kind of how far back that goes. And at what point NFTs became part of the deal and whether they've kind of replaced everything that came before that. Okay. Well, I would, it goes back probably till I was like five years old opening baseball card packs. Uh, yeah. And, and I, I was that kid that, that had, you know, everybody back when we grew up, you know, at least around, around me, everybody collected baseball cards. It was like the, the golden era, I guess the first golden era, it's, it's had a resurgence um, recently, but, but yeah, everybody uh, had a lot, but I was that kid that kind of had more than anybody else. Cause I guess I had nothing better to do. I don't know. I just, I just <laughs> love collecting them, hoarding them, sorting them, all of that. And uh, you know, I never grew out of it. I always found myself coming back to it. And when I got older and, you know, had a little bit more disposable income. I had fun buying all the stuff that I couldn't afford. Not all the stuff, but some of the stuff that I couldn't afford when I was a little kid. Sure. Like, you know, the Mickey Mantles and, and you know, that was just like so unreachable at the time. Right. Like, well, shoot, I could, I could get those now. And so, so yeah, I, I always kept, uh, yeah, I always, I always kept that itch uh, scratched, if you will, you know, as an adult, you know, from time to time. Um, and, uh, so what was the question? So NFTs in 2018, then um, I saw an article on Coindesk or somewhere, and um, Andy is going to know this. Uh, it, it was for uh, MLB champions mm -hmm. was coming out with their NFTs, and I got it immediately. Um, it was like, wow, I saw them, unlike most everybody else that I learned later, but I saw them as digital baseball cards. Yeah. And I got it and I wanted in and, you know, there's a long story, I guess, behind uh, where that eventually took things because um, it led into Crypto Slam. But as far as a collector, you know, I got into it and, and started buying these things, um, not even knowing that there was there was a game, uh, you know, a, a game. I don't know how much your viewers know, but there that game was on Ethereum as well, just like so rare. And, um, you know, in order to to get uh, some of the some of the uh, the figures i think is what they call them um you had to like do um lineup cards and it was tied to live games and it, it was a blast but i didn't even know that going in because as a collector i didn't care i just wanted the first mike trout and and i got it and i paid way too much for it but uh you know then i knew shohei otani was a rookie and so this is how my brain is working i'm thinking right. well i want to get as many of these and if if you go to crypto slam and, and look under my username which is cunny thumbers you'll see I, i've got a you know, my, my MLB champions collection is, is a lot better than my so rare collection, um, <laughs> for better or worse. Uh, but, but yeah, so I, I amassed a lot of these over 2018 and, and 2019. And, uh, so yeah, as, as a collector, um, you know, it's certainly inspired what eventually led into crypto slavery. When you first started collecting, did you ever collect anything that wasn't sports related, like the garbage pail stuff or, uh, like Pokemon or I'm trying to think of other things that like when, when I was younger, what was out there? I know garbage pail was a big thing. 
I'd say no. I think yeah. I probably bought a pack and thought it was dumb because I couldn't get a George Brett, uh, right? Or whatever the pack. <laughs> so I, 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 you know, those were stickers. So I, I, I think I remember, you know, taking the stickers apart. But those are worth a lot now too. Yeah. Right. So th- I guess that was that was dumb uh, not saving those. those well, it's, it's, what it's I would have been buying baseball any of it. Wise. Yeah. Were you? collecting with the idea of reselling one day or were you a collector to keep? Well, it's both. And I think that's, what's interesting about collectors. Um, Most collectors, and I I guess I can't speak for everybody, but it's like the, the buying and selling is a, is a means to kind of feed the habit or the addiction or the, or the hobby or whatever it is. It's like, that's why you buy and sell. And of course, you know, sure. You'd love to, you know, get, uh, get in early on some hot rookie and then have it go up in value and then flip it. But, um, you know, I, I would say that most collectors have, have sold something like who, who just buys and buys and, and never sells. I, I think that's part of it. And what's beautiful about blockchain and NFTs, it's so much easier than, <laughs> um, you know, what's interesting. If you see that Lou Holtz picture right behind me, I've got like all these, I got like baseball cards uh, and basketball cards and stuff uh, in, in a in a room back there, and uh, it's such a pain in the butt to get rid of them because I have to go and spend the time and and listing them on eBay. I, eBay, I can do it, but it's like I, I don't know. It kind of takes the fun out of it. But with my NFTs, I can just go somewhere and there's plenty of options and yep. hit a few buttons and they're for sale. And I can turn that into some sort of currency and then go buy the stuff that I really want. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, I just struggle. I, I guess there's really no way to to put this whole like collector term in a single box of people who are like, oh, I, I collect things. And it's like, well, most people who collect things do it to have some sort of financial reward at some point. But you make an interesting point that the financial reward is used to then just buy more collectibles. Uh-huh. Um, like you said, kind of feed the habit, right? Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Um, yeah, which is really interesting um, because I think that kind of s- is separate from people who uh, exist in all of these worlds. But in so rare, like we, there are a number of people we know that they're basically just traders. Like they, they have no interest in collecting, but if they can buy for X and they can sell for X plus one, then they're in. Um, did you ever get into like a trading routine or has it always been kind of collectible and then uh, you know, just slowly working your way to, to the bigger stuff. Well, sure. Well, back to your question or uh, Andy's question, did I collect anything else? No, it's mainly what I care about is, is the baseball stuff. Um, and so, so yeah, I've, I've owned some, some so rare cards in the past and, um, I think I, I don't have many left now, um, which is, uh, I, I sold them too early, but I, so I was more of a flipper with so rare, uh, NBA top shot, uh, you know, you, you just, I don't have that emotional attachment to the NBA like I do to the baseball. And that's part of the collector too. There's some sort of like a mo- irrational slash emotional attachment, which drives decisions. And I don't, I don't have that. I, I never had it with top shots. I thought they were cool and still do. But it's like when I, when I saw the opportunity, like, wow, these cosmic packs that I bought uh, back in, back in July or whenever those first came out, I wish I'd bought more. It was like, wow, I could, I could sell these for, you know, five, 10 times what I paid for them. Ooh, yeah, sure. You know, right. see you later. And, um, you know, had, had I known I would have saved those and, and sold them for a lot more. Um, <laughs> because that, that would, I got out like in, I don't know, like December maybe is, is, is a whole other story, but, but, but yes, to your point though, I was a flipper um, with NBA top shot and, uh, garbage pill kids, which is on wax. I, I, I flip those, um, you know, I'm trying to think of what else I might collect, uh, crypto twerps I collect because I, I liked that project. You know, I had an emotional attachment cause I, I liked the art of, a, of, of one guy in particular that, uh, that drew some stuff and, and did a, did a Hulk, uh, a Hulk Hogan card, uh, co-branded with crypto slam is called Hulk token. So I got awesome. into that project and, and so I collect that. So there's, you know, I, I, I try to improve my set and, and get it to rank higher on the crypto slam rankings. And so that, that would between MLB champions and crypto twerps, those are probably the only two I collect. Everything else I, I flip. What and, you know, now I'm so busy with crypto slam. I don't get to do it as much. 
I, I try to do it as much as possible because it's I think it's good. It's just it's fun. Number one, <laughs> to get in on these projects, and, and number two, it's uh, I think it's just good to stay in the game and experience uh, you know the the pains and the enjoyment. I guess that everybody else did like like I was you know before Crypto Slam blew up and kind of lost my time to do stuff do that kind of stuff. And he was just talking about how he sold his top shots a little too early as well. So at least you guys have that in common. Oh, sure yeah. Did. Sure did. Um, so talking about Crypto Slam blowing up, I mean, you want to talk a little bit about how that happened? And I, I think you have a pretty big investor on board or? Yeah, we've got we've got a couple. Yeah, actually. Um, so first question, how it blew up. You know, this is a kind of the long story is so rare is actually partially to thank, I guess, for the luck crypto slam has had. Um, uh, so the long story is crypto slam was, uh, I, I coded that before I started getting help. I coded that as a means to organize MLB champions because mm -hmm. as a collector, there was all the stuff on the blockchain. Nobody knew what all the rarities were and it was, somebody was going to do it if I didn't do it. So I did it. And then that game eventually, or that project eventually, as Andy knows, started to go downhill a bit. And a lot of the, the early adopters who were in on that, um, they're like, well, hey, there's this new thing called SoRare coming out. And I put all this work in, in a crypto slam and it's like, well, shoot, it would just stink to kind of waste all that. So maybe I should go track SoRare too. And uh, SoRare, as you might know, they were not multi-chain or they were multi-chain at the time. They were on Loom. Um, with a lot of the transactions. So that forced me um, and I had hired a, a developer by that point um, to go and build Crypto Slam in a way to where it could handle more than one blockchain, which is the best thing that ever happened. Well, because um, fast forward a year and a half later, you know, we had a jump start on the boom, I guess, because had we not done that, then when NBA Top Shot came out uh, on Flow, um, you know, actually before that was Garbage Pail Kids on Wax. So there's your third blockchain. And then uh, Flow came out last summer and, and we were super early on that and just all over it and we're in on their beta. And uh, so had had things tracking pr pretty early. Um, we we're tracking Top Shot. I don't remember if it was July last year, August, whenever we got it rolling, but it was pretty early. So to answer your question, what happened was we got lucky because we, we, uh, we're tracking NBA Top Shot when NBA Top Shot blew up and uh, Mark Cuban owns some, um, you know, Dallas Maverick moments. And he wants to know, well, how many are out there? You know, where do I where do I go? I don't know if he Googled it or what he did. But at some point he stumbled across Crypto Slam because at the time it was the only place you could go. This is like January, really pretty much the only place you could go to find rarity information and uh, completed sales, uh, you know, marketplace listings, that kind of stuff. So it's, it's obviously ballooned a lot since then, the other tools that are out there, both sure. inside and outside of Top Shot. But that, uh, that led to our first investor, which I, you were alluding to, I bet with the big time investor, Mark Cuban, um, you know, um, getting interested in, in crypto slam back, you know, several months ago. So he just call you up on the phone and like, Hey, Randy, <laughs> I love no, Twitter. Slam. <laughs> it was Twitter. Twitter even yeah. better. <laughs> I don't know if we were, my, I still remember it was like a Sunday night. I was sitting, I don't know, watching something on TV with my wife. Um, Maybe in a Chiefs game or something, but you know, and I'm checking my phone and I'm like, what? You know, you've got a new direct message and it's M, M Cuban. And at first I thought it was, seriously, I thought it was like somebody BSing me and, you know, yeah. um, and I kind of dug into it in a little bit and it, it, it was legit. So uh, that's, that's what started everything. That's awesome. Gotta love it. Gotta love it. Um, given that you have so many uh, NFTs listed on Crypto Slam, like are there new new ones that pop up that um, I don't know if you can actually answer that question of of whether you find them ridiculous or not. But um, it's more like with so many that that are now trackable on Crypto Slam, do you find yourself like intrigued by stuff that you had never thought of, or is it more just like okay, that's a new one, but I'm going to stick to my to my baseball stuff for the most part. I would say as a flipper, it might get me interested. Like if I hear of something hot that's coming out that I have no interest, you know, it doesn't trigger that emotional response that, that I was um, referencing earlier. 
Yeah, I would get in on just because everybody else is. And I would, I would try to, you know, flip some, I don't know, maybe what did I buy last summer? Like William Shatner packs. I mean, I remember that not into star Trek, but I, I had a feeling, you know, I was watching the on sale and, and that was a wax sale and they were, they were going pretty quick. And I, and I knew I'm pretty good with, uh, knowing the supply of things and, you know, just from crypto slam and kind of knowing, well, wow, wow, this is going to sell out pretty quick. So here's an opportunity that sells out then, um, you know, sells out fast and demand is greater than supply. Chances are you could, you could flip those. So that there's an example of something came out. I didn't care about. It was good for, we needed to track it on crypto slam too. So I wanted to know, know the product well. So how about as far as adding new projects onto crypto slam? Like what's your, do you have criteria or is it just like, as soon as I, if something new is out, I'm going to add it on there. I would say the criteria is first of all, is it, do people care about it? It doesn't have to be me caring about it at this yeah. point. At first it was, but, but now it's well beyond that. So the, is it, is it going to be around? Do people care about it? Number two, and this is what stinks. It's like the biggest pain point is, um, do we support that blockchain yet? And, and that's what I've been working really hard on that. That's that's where a lot of the investor resources, you know, where, where it helps. It's not just me and another guy now. We've expanded the team quite a bit. So uh, so now, you know, oh, I'm trying to think of some of the things that are out there. Uh, there's some stuff on Matic. So you'll yep. see Matic on CryptoSlam soon. Um Axie Infinity migrated to Ronin. They were they were Ethereum only. Mm -hmm. They migrated to Ronin to bypass the fees, and um, I think it's their their own blockchain. Um, so yeah, we don't have that yet. So we don't track Axie, and Axie will when it comes on soon will likely rank number one or at worst top three on, yeah. on the page rankings. So that stinks. I hate that. That's like what I hate worst about being the Crypto Slam guy is that those those rankings aren't aren't complete because you know, part of the criteria is, do we support that chain? And so, you know, and we're going to be in a better position there, but, but yeah, but mainly it's got to be relevant. Something people will, will care about and try to pay attention to what's coming out there to where, you know, maybe we can get in early. You know, you heard of Blanco's block party, for instance, I was, you know, that's going to be big someday. And, and, you know, we'll need to get in early to be able to track that because it's, it's just a lot of dev work to do it the right way. Yeah. Are you guys involved in all the projects? I think there's a, what, what, uh, something called Sand. Are you guys on, on those ones as well? Not yet. Not that not yet. one. That's another one you're working on, I guess. Yeah. Or possibly. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's in the in the queue. I got a list somewhere here. There's like 10, 12 chain side chains. Crazy. Some of them are getting close, which is exciting because this has been a pain point for a while. Ever since um, you know projects started caring more about uh, you know the the rankings on the homepage. It's kind of, this is, that's, what's cool about, you know, the position we're in now is those, those rankings are relevant. So it's good and bad. It's good that people care. It's bad that there's some stuff we need on there that isn't on there yet. Right. Did you have like significant blockchain experience before setting it up? Zero. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Yep. That's crazy. That's crazy. I think I maybe bought some Ethereum just, messing around uh, a couple months before MLB champions, but I bet my first made a mask transaction was, was to buy something. Yeah. To buy an NFT, not really mm -hmm. knowing what I was doing. <laughs> Looking I back, this works. Like, oh, what's that? I said, I hope this works and you push the button. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I made multiple MetaMask transactions and I still hope put do that. I hope this works every time. <laughs> you know what's bad too is if we look if we look back, um I can't remember when did you get in, um, Andy? What what year did you get in? For uh MLB? Yeah. I guess it was late twenty eighteen. Uh that seems or was it late twenty seventeen? I don't so know. Were you in where we had to pay gas to yes. do the yes. lineup cards? Yep. Like I can only imagine how much gas we wasted because they had their, their cards on chain. So you had to do a meta mask transaction and um, you know, so so at the time, but like looking at extrapolate that out, all those cards that we had to set up, you know, it's, it's a huge chunk of money in today's Ethereum dollars. Real quick I mean, for the people that play that, that are listening, that are so rare specific, that would be the equivalent of every time you set a lineup in so rare, 
or make a change to your lineup yeah. it's so rare, you would have to pay gas fees. Yeah, oh, imagine the guy gets right? hurt, you know, and you got to take him out or whatever. It's gas every time. Yep. And it was expensive gas. It was a lot of gas because whoever wrote the code, you know, um, I don't want to get too into the details, but it right. just consumed a lot because it wasn't efficient because there was this big lineup card with all this data. So it was this insanely expensive transaction. And it's, you know, it's on there. The beauty of the blockchain is just on there forever clogging up Ethereum now. Um, right. So silly. <laughs> I remember they were like, you know, it was gas was cheap at the time. It was like five guay or whatever. It was like as low as it could possibly be. And we would wait until it was as cheap as it could be. And then you would make a modification to your lineup card and it would still be like an $8 transaction. And this is when yeah. it was dirt cheap. Like that was insane at the time. Yeah. You can't even imagine now. <laughs> that is pretty wild. Well, it's like so rare. They, I don't know how much they paid attention, but they, obviously saw this early on and were smart about it. Uh, it's one of the many things that they got right um, early on, in my opinion. So, yeah. Yeah. Really they, really they, like yeah, you're talking about when they were on Loom. They've been on Ethereum now for, I don't know, a year now, paying the high gas fees and uh, not ideal, um, and, but they are working on, you know, migrating to Layer 2 or roll-ups or whatever and, uh, it's going to be much better for them. Yeah, so, we'll have to we'll have to do some work on our end. We've we've heard about the roll ups of the mm -hmm. so rare tech teams gotten in contact with us. So then that's that's part of the challenge, you know. So a big project like so rare has this big upgrade, and you know we have to be prepared to to mobilize to, to support that because right. So rare is certainly one we want to you know do our do our best job tracking. You know, it was one of the first, and you know still get a decent amount of. Decent amount of traffic from uh, so rare users, so yeah. it's one that'll be at the top of our list for sure. So one of the topics that comes up a lot in so rare is like if it, the the fact that you own all of these cards yourself and they're on the blockchain. So if something happens to so rare, you still own these cards. And uh, Andy gets that look on his face every time because he thinks of his MLBC stuff that because uh, that game is not going on anymore, and yet you still own those things, but. Um, I imagine they're not as valuable as they were when the, the site was going on. Um, but you, are you still collecting them, Randy? I haven't sold. I mean, it's, it's pretty painful to do transactions just on Ethereum because of the transaction fees. Um, you know, I would argue like I wouldn't sell them anyway. Um, because, uh, I feel like, and, and I'm, I'm not the only one, um, I feel like they will have their day. I feel like so rare cards, especially those early 2018s, I feel like those will have their day as, as a collectible. Um, and it, it may not be tomorrow, next month, next year, but it, at some point, um, you know, there will be somebody care enough about those. And, and all it takes is kind of a spark to get something going. Look what happened with Mooncats. You know, Mooncats took off because it was what the second NFT project. If you're not familiar with Mooncats, it's it's on yeah. our we're tracking it now on, on the homepage. It had a crazy spike in in uh, in March. Uh, CryptoPunks, you know, it's just this parabolic rise. Uh, you know, there's a reason for that. It was it's as a you know it's it's as a oh, there we go. Uh, it's on the screenshot here or screen share. Um, I guess CryptoPunks has a has value besides a collectible. It's kind of a status symbol too, as avatars. But, but, but you know, um, there. It's, see, if you go to Mooncats, like if you click on the thirteen thousand seven ten, you'll see. Um, look at the spike that occurred. Hopefully, this comes up. There we go. And look at that spike when it first came out. That was because they went and rescued this this previously dead project because. You know, it, it, it had a story behind it. it, had this narrative. So imagine a narrative where at some point, you know, tops, Major League Baseball, whatever, they go, they really go mainstream, like full NBA top shot. And it's successful to the point to where that there's, you know, tens, hundreds of thousands of collectors in. And they're like, well, wouldn't it be interesting to own the first officially licensed MLB collectible? Now, all of a sudden, just like you see with Mooncats there, now all of a sudden, that's all it would take is somebody to, you know, 
Mark Cuban, I don't know anybody to tweet about it. And that could happen at, at any point. Right. And I feel like so rare is in the same boat. You know, if I don't know if we want to get in on that yet, but if, if, if I were to buy so rare today, you know, I would I certainly have my eyes on those, those original um, 2018s that don't have, you know, I assume a lot of those guys have retired or gotten hurt or may not have utility anymore. And, and so that they're not priced very high. That, that's what I could get. So you think even like a player that may not be like a special player, well-known, whatever, just the fact that it's an early 2018, that it might be. Absolutely. Yeah. Because it might yeah, be part of the center. What? It's the first one. Um, you know, and the, and the, the populations. Um, so, you know, they say that you can mint a hundred, right? But yeah. they didn't mint a hundred. Player. Yeah, and, and some of those just didn't have hardly any mints. So, um, like, imagine someday it becomes, like, cool to collect the best 2018 So Rare set. Yeah. Now this, you know, obscure player that So Rare may have only minted six of becomes, uh, due to supply and demand, becomes insanely valuable because there were hardly any minted. Yeah. Now, how many, if there's only, I don't, I don't, I haven't looked at the, at the rarities in a while. You can, can actually see it on the, on the checklist page there. Uh, I think we have them there. Um, but uh, yeah, if you go, go to checklist and go to 2018, 19 master all clubs. So it's, it's, it's going to, uh, hopefully this comes up. Yeah. Yeah. Look at that. So who's that first guy? Checklist number one. That, so he was minted early if he's showing up as checklist number one for us. And there were only five. Now, I don't see there's none for sale right now. But um, at number 10, there's there's one of those for sale. Adrian uh, Trable. You guys may know who that is. I know one of these low mint guys, Sorloth, uh, plays for in, uh, like Leipzig now, I think. And Quinny owns one of his cards. There's only like four of them. And he's a good player. And his only card is a 2018. Yeah, there you go. A hundred bucks for that. I would do that. Take a gamble on that. There's only 13 of those. And if you know, you would need that set or you need him for the set. And I don't know, I guess that's what's going through my mind. Cause I know right. nothing about any of these players except for the super popular ones. And I, I don't play the game because I would get destroyed. But, uh, but yeah, if I got into collecting the cards, those would be a few of the things I would look at. You know, something I'm thinking about this, um, I was thinking about this kind of prepping my brain, I guess, for this um, podcast. I don't know if you guys knew this, but um, you know how on the card, so rare lists the, the, the number like it. So it's number one of a hundred or number yep. 10. Of 100. And presumably that's the, the order it was minted in. Right. Is that why number one, number 10 or, or so you would think. Right. Well, on the blockchain, um, if, if you look, so rare did not mint those perfectly in order. So like what people think are number one, just because it shows up on the image is, is not number one in terms of the blockchain. Interesting. That's really interesting. And, and, and there's those nuggets all over the place. I verified yeah. that uh, earlier this afternoon because I was like, you know, I thought I remembered seeing that. And if I ever got into buying up so rare, I would go buy those up. I'm not the gonna not number that. ones. Yeah. The true number ones, yeah. because like an NBA top shot, is it, is a LeBron James number one, number one, because they made that the first serial number or was it because it was first on the blockchain? Well, originally they cared because it was first on the blockchain because they, they didn't even used to have serial numbers on NBA Top Shot, but they realized early on that people cared because of the right. time actually. And then, and then they put them on there. Um, I think ultimately people will care about both. I think they will care about what So Rare said was number one, but I think ultimately they'll also, you know, care about which one was, was, was first. Yeah. Hmm. That's really interesting. Um, what are your thoughts on the one thing that always like kind of annoyed me or maybe not annoyed me, but it was always weird to me in top shot was uh, the lower the mint always meant higher the price. And it wasn't just like one, two, three, always carried a higher price. It was like all the way down, you would see prices slowly uh, increase the closer you got to one. And I don't know, is a 13 
that different than a 50 mint? What are your thoughts on that? Well, imagine you're, you're buying a, a LeBron James and there's 2,500 of them, mm-hmm. you know, um, what else is, they're all the same. So, I mean, what else is there to differentiate them? I, there actually are some other things, but, um, you know, that's, that's the simplest way to differentiate them. Okay. By, you know, the, the, the earlier one has more utility and, and it's like, that's not an NBA top shot thing. You'll see it, uh, on all the wax projects, um, you know, it's a, uh, if it hasn't made its way to so rare, I would expect in the long run, if people eventually do care about these beyond the utility, it absolutely like a, like a number four is going to be more important than a number 40. Okay. Unless the guy's Jersey number is number 40, by the way, because then right. it's, which that's the other thing uh, that we kind of have listed here that really kind of translates into so rare. Cause I mean, I know some other projects have different attributes. So that's really the attribute that we have to go off of is a mint number. And you can compare that to a Jersey number. So Jersey mints. And I, I, I know in top shot that is huge. It's considered a very big deal. You see that, that in other sports projects. Yeah. Tops MLB. It's, it's a big thing. They like, uh, Top Shot puts it um, either in their API or on the chain to where we could get Jersey mints and flag them. And, you know, when we're valuing, you know, crypto slam value, if you've ever been in there with the projects where we assign values to all these, you know, we're able to tell exactly what is that multiplier assigned to a a Jersey mint compared to a common bare bones player. And that multiplier is what's interesting is very similar from, you know, one blockchain to the next, one project to the next. Well, it's, it's just amazing how that kind of flushed out. So a Mike Trout tops MLB jersey mint is going to carry a similar multiplier to a LeBron James one. And so I would, you know, I don't know this. I, I don't, haven't followed Sorare close enough, but I would think that it would, that would eventually carry a similar multiplier. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the, what's what's really interesting to me about that and the sport of soccer is your best players typically have numbers, you know, one through ten. Uh, you know, yeah. they're they're lower numbers, so uh, it kind of really reiterates that the importance of a low mint being even more important. Yeah, for sure. You know, I think there are other things that are going to come out eventually. Uh, in addition to, because again, all these are the same. If, if we talk about NBA Top Shot, there's 3,500 of some of these. You know, what do you, they've invented things like double jersey mints. So, you know, if you got like a 2-3, two, 2-3, three, two, three, uh, Michael Jordan mints. So he was 23. So number 23. Uh, you know, what I saw was so rare was uh, there, the age is, is right there on the image. And so this guy's age is number 23. Well, as a collector, would I rather have number 23 if he's 23 years old or number 24 yep. or even number a lower mint? Would I rather have a 23 than a 12? I think I'd go after the 23 because it matches his, his age. Hmm. Why not? I mean, if, if, if I noticed it, I bet other people might too. Yeah, that's cool. I like that perspective. Hmm. They uh, do draft picks like draft year in NBA Top Shot too, like <clears> stuff <throat> like that. If you're, yeah, or not draft year, but draft number draft around like that kind of stuff. Speaking of which, I think championship year cards are, uh, uh, carry, carry value a lot of times, sure. like, you know, if it's the year that the player won a trophy or something. Do they carry more value now already? Hmm. I don't think so. I, I we just really haven't seen the collector aspect in. So we're beyond what number one mints, Andrew. I think that that's really, it number one mints have the higher price and that's about it. Yeah. I think that's the only one. What What's weird about so rare is I just don't feel like we have, we've had this, like we had this collector boom in what was that February or March, Yeah, but there was no rhyme or reason to the accumulation of those cards. It was just people were like, Oh, I, I want to get some of these because I think they're going to be worth more one day. And so there really wasn't a, an emphasis on, you know, one of a hundreds or one of tens. And it was more just, let me just get a few of these. And but hopefully it, it was targeted a little bit. They went and got the, you know, star hall of fame type players. They bought Ronaldo's, they bought Neymar's, they bought yes. 
Uh, and they bought a lot of the great uh, American players that are in the game. I, I know McKinney, you know, his price went all the way up to one ETH and uh, or a few other players, uh, Musa, Hope, their prices, you know, really kind of, I don't know, rubber band. But it, but it felt like the ones that were purchased were purchased because they were for sale. Yeah. And that I they didn't necessarily that say, and I'm gone. I'm done. Right. Yeah. Right. And so, so because, so we've had those people come in, they have since left uh, to, and either sold their cards or are still holding them, but there's not, there hasn't been this like continued collector uh, focus on these cards. So like, I, I agree, like the, the number one mints, uh, I think they're important for the important players. Um, but then I think you can make the argument that the all of the cards of important players are valuable. Like I don't I don't know what the multiple is that the number one gets you because I'm I just haven't seen enough people pay extra for it. Uh I've seen people not sell them, like they'll buy the you'll they'll get it in auction and then I don't think anybody's spending extra on one of a hundred or one of 10. Um, and I think part of that is specific to so rare. And it's like, this is another top, like huge topic that we wanted to touch on, but like uh, the utility of these cards in the game drive the, the value of these cards significantly. Like there are obviously a handful of, of players, Ronaldo yeah. and Mbappe that will be expensive, but it seems like the utility continues to be the reason that th these cards are priced as they are. And so if, if it's a, a nobody player, I don't think you're, you're getting any more for their one of a hundred than their 73 of a hundred, because if they're not that valuable anyway in the game, why am I buying the one of a hundred anyway? Maybe. Well, like like Randy said earlier, it could be somebody down the road that wants to collect a set of all the Anderlich players. I want their number one mints from the 2018 season. Somebody might decide that they want to try to make that set. Absolutely. I mean, you, you already saw it in February. I would I would argue or not argue, but I would guess those were NBA top shot collectors. Like what utility is there in NBA top shot? Uh, None that I know of. There, there's nothing. I think someday they're they're gonna they got something planned. But look at how big that got, and and they didn't have to build in any utility. In, in fact, like the only I guess the utility they did have was and this is something so rare may, may be thinking about. I don't know, but just something as simple as collect all five of these moments in the challenge, and right. you get another moment. Just something as insanely simple as that drove all kinds of transaction volume. But but aside from that, there was no utility at all. It was just as a collectible because they liked the dunk they saw, or you know, there were people in there that weren't collectors too. That they were the flippers, like we talked about earlier. Um, but but yeah, and I don't, I, I wouldn't think um, for for so rare to full, fully maximize its potential. And this is what's really beautiful about blockchain um if if so rares cards if their value is only dependent upon the utility in the game then really like what's the point of even having these things on the blockchain i would wonder just have them in a database somewhere on your own server and would anybody really know the difference but if they are these assets that have collectability that people are going to care about in perpetuity um, then now all of a sudden they, that they're also collectibles, you know, the, the physical collectibles we have, um, they may have had utility at some point, I don't know, but uh, for the most part, they didn't have utility either. So with NFTs, we can, we can actually merge the two. So it's so rare is done just fine with, without having any sort of collectability. They, they've been consistent. And if you look at our charts, you know, they've, they had their, their spike and, and, you know, coming back down to earth a little bit, it's been a lot smoother than, than some of the other ones because, because mm -hmm. of the utility. But just imagine what if you could combine them both. Now you've got, you've got like a true monster, I think, um, by attracting both types. Yeah, so look at that. If you look at, if you scroll down here and the historical sales, like go to, um, 
I don't know, like March 2021, I bet is probably the peak. Yep. Yeah, there we go. So March 2021. So we're down 50 percent. So we're down two times since since then in, in May. NBA Top Shot's down five times. And that's because, uh, you know, the bubble is bigger. There wasn't, you know, there wasn't, um, I would think that's because there wasn't the utility because there wasn't anything to do with them other than, than collect and speculate and do right. that. Yeah. I, I think that's another thing, you know, utility, there's always a reason to own the thing. You can win, win more things with them. Um, and then uh, with that, with that said, I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to bash other projects, but we kind of, we kind of talked about this earlier, Andrew, and it's that question of, okay, I have a, and 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 I'll I'll preface this by saying I I was watching another podcast and I heard somebody else have this comment, and they they made the comment that so, uh, so rare cards, if they were ever to, was it? Let me let me reread my question, but. Since so rare cards have utility, will they be worthless when they don't have utility anymore? Um, how do you view that verse? The comment of you know my thing never had utility, so like a Top Shot thing never had utility, um, but it's still always going to be valuable because it never had utility. Like, I would think it 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 uh, probably like the guy who bought it for utility only and isn't a collector. Yeah. I could see where it wouldn't be worth anything to him. He would be a seller. So yeah. he would sell. But somebody else coming in, like, um, you know, I'm interested in other sports and, and so are plenty of other people, but we don't want to, we don't know enough to play the game, yeah. but we want to, you know, enjoy, uh, still enjoy the cards and the, and the, for, for what they are. Yeah. I mean, I, I couldn't care less about the utility to be honest. If, if so I were going to buy if right now, if Ronaldo retired tomorrow and there were a bunch of people selling his card because they couldn't use it in the game anymore, you'd, you'd be a buyer. Sure. I'd yeah. be, I'd be, you know, would look at the, you know, I, I would look at the ones that are more scarce than the other ones. And, and yeah, absolutely. Now yeah. you are taking a, sometimes you have to think a lot longer term, like, um, and which is, which has been hard with crypto because crypto Returns have been pretty darn quick, and if you want that quick buck, um, you know the it, it may take a little longer on the payoff uh, yeah. than some people are used to, but but or or maybe not. Um, we've we've seen seen projects take off too, uh, just from a pure collectability like that. See, and I totally agree with that. I agree that if you know you have a player that's it and it has to fit a certain mold. Um, I think that there are cards out there that that you know. They may not be worth anything down the road. It might be some no-name player, um, and it's a the seventy-fifth card minted or something like. Okay, that might when he retires, that card might not be worth anything. But you talk about some of these guys that were on championship teams, or you know, the star player on their team for a year or two, or whatever. Um, I, I, I feel like even when they retire, those cards are always going to be collectible, always have value. People, they bring back memories for people. Um, People will want them. Yeah, I think so rare could do things to help with that too. Like just kind of thinking out loud, but like like imagine if you had to have uh, a certain collection score. I don't know. Like maybe maybe only the top 20, um, 2018 collections or 2019, whatever, whatever year, get, gave you certain privileges within so rare. Or maybe anybody kind of like NBA Top Shot, anybody that collected a certain group, maybe they got a, a Ronaldo uh, minted just for them, you know, and that was the only way you could get it. Uh, I think those would be some simple ways to take collectability and, and turn it into, I guess, transaction volume and getting people to care. And there's probably 50 and other things you could do. That's a cool idea. Like you could turn it into uh... – um, utility in the game. You could say if you collect this number of Belgian cards, you could enter the Belgian tournament this weekend. Or if you collect enough yeah. uh, Japan cards, you can enter the Jap uh, Japan tournament this weekend. So, yeah, I'm sure you could do fun stuff like that. Yeah. I, I think, too, like, so like the 2018s, it's almost a bet on so rare itself. I know it's, you know, uh, the, the Belgian league isn't 
from what I understand, I don't think it's one of the most popular leagues, but, but, but it is, but it's, I don't know. It's, if, if so rare turns into, into a monster, um, then I don't know, as a collector, wouldn't you care about the first so rare cards ever made? Yeah. I don't care who the guy is. It's just, it's a so rare card. It well, really the, the best part is some of those early 2018 cards were West Ham, uh, were, were from West Ham, which is a team that's in the EPL. It's a big, bigger club. So that is pretty cool. Yeah, there you go. Andy, to follow up on what you were saying, like I feel like uh, utility is almost so important to so rare cards that you, if you want to emphasize the collector side of it, you need to offer utility also. Like I'm just not sure. I mean, obviously it's can change if they have a ton of users, but it seems like just marketing towards collectors isn't enough because the market is so dedicated to the utility of the cards. I mean, look at the coaches cards, right? Those seem to have, you have, one? They, have they have zero. I don't know any. You're right. Um, they, they, they have zero utility in the game, but people are paying a good amount of money for them because depending on which ones, I mean, there's a couple that are, um, you know, a little iffy, but like Maradona, uh, Zidane, people are paying big bucks for those cards because they're, you know, they're star players, legends of the game. But they're also pretty rare. Like not even the, the cards themselves, but it, like we have like four of them. Like if you had a coach card from every team, does that help? Well, if you had a coach card for every team, they're not all legends, though. You know, the, but, you know well, that's true. Mauricio yeah. Sarri, you know, you have the cigarette hanging out. Um, that might be a cool card, actually. It would be like a good <laughs> punk. <laughs> but, uh, um, I, I mean, just some of the, some of the coaches' cards. Uh, did, who was the one that we saw the other day? Was it Phil? Was it Neville? Phil Neville, yeah. Yeah, I mean, eh, I don't know that people care that much about that one. It's not a Zidane, that's for sure. Yeah. I kind of have to re remind myself that uh, like I have a few baseball cards from when I was growing up. Well, I have a ton of baseball cards from when I was growing up, but I have a few that are actually worth something. And I kind of have to remind myself that, uh, or maybe, I, maybe I'm doing it wrong, but like it feels like if you're collecting, certainly if you're doing it in something like Top Shot where it's packs, like a lot of us who have accumulated baseball cards over the years, have a lot of them that are basically worthless. Yeah. But you almost look at that as the price that you paid for the ones that aren't. And mm -hmm. so the fact that there are like a ton of so rare cards that in 15 years are, are worthless, maybe that's okay. Like I feel like there's sort of this underlying thought from a lot of so rare users that like all of these cards will have value at some point because like they're ours forever. But like that doesn't mean they have any value, but maybe if you have enough of the ones that have value, then all of the ones that are essentially worthless, like that's okay. That's what you have in your virtual trunk as opposed to the trunk I have in my basement right now, <laughs> Fernando Tatis senior cards. Do you feel like there are a lot of so rare cards? Is that like the sentiment that there's just a lot of them out there? I don't feel like there is. Okay, no. okay. I, I didn't know where you're going with that. Cause yeah, I, I would think that there's not. Uh, have they ever minted more than a hundred? Well, I mean, it's a hundred and what a hundred and eleven is the limit, yeah. right? With all the rarities, right? Yeah, that's that's nothing. That's you know, all of your our worthless baseball cards. I mean, if you think of how many of those were minted, <laughs> yeah, you know, um, yeah, like a hundred, a population of a hundred is is you know a big deal, like in physical packs today. Like they'll have special inserts and autographs and that kind of stuff. And they'll limit those to a hundred or, or less. And, you know, that's, that's a pretty big deal. And, and those are the special products. ones. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think, and so rare has always done a great job of that. They, I think they're all special just because they, they didn't oversaturate the market. And, and, you know, it's reflected in the stats because there hasn't been like an epic crash. I think uh, had they messed up the economy of that and printed too many, I think you would have seen it which other projects have done, you, you can definitely mess that up. But I, I think they've done as good, if, if not better than, than anybody from what I've seen. Awesome. I think the, the huge benefit they have is that their player universe is so big. 
that they could end up making thousands and thousands and thousands of, of so rare cards while still maintaining 111 per player. And so it's like this huge benefit of like, if we offer something from a league anywhere in the world, people in that country may like them more than others, but like at some point there really just aren't that many. Like I, I feel like we have to remember that. And, and frankly, most players don't even get to 111. Like there are only a handful right. of ones that have gotten to 111. So we have to like even remember that even, even they have less than that even. And, and yet um, sometimes it feels like there are too many. <laughs> so real quick, you've asked this question before, Andrew, and I want to hear Randy's perspective. We've had very few cards hit a, hit a 100th mint. So there's, in theory, there's more number one mints of players than there are 100th mints. Do you think that the 100th card of a player is more valuable than the number one of a player? That's a good question. Um, I think potentially. I think a a last mint of a player carries a premium regardless. Okay. Last mints are a thing. Like yep. if there was 67 minted, getting number 67 is is a thing also. Um, so just that alone would help. Um, number 100s are a thing just because it's a nice even number. Okay. Um, I'm speaking from NBA Top Shot and like garbage pail kid experience. Yeah. Uh, so now you're saying just the sheer fact that there aren't a lot of hundreds. I, th I think potentially, yeah. I'd, I'd be curious to see how that would that would play out. Hmm. I would think, yeah, that could be a really big deal. Yeah. Huh. I mean, just fundamentally, it, you, you pretty much have to look at it more from the so rare card universe as opposed to the player universe. But right. like everyone has a first mint. But not everybody, in fact, only a handful of people have a hundredth mint. I mean, frankly, there's probably just as few that hit 99 or whatever, whatever the number is. But um, I don't know, it, feel, it felt like, uh, like I never, I still have not participated in Top Shot. And the, the jersey number thing was kind of a, seems silly to me. Um, like I, I get it, but it seems silly. And I'm curious, like what what other things people could come up with to say like, no, 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 this is more valuable because of X. And I'm curious, Randy, if you've seen any of whatever that X is where you're like, I don't know about that one, <laughs> but people are still willing well, we to pay hit more on it. We hit on it a little bit earlier uh, with, you know, um, gosh, what was it? Oh, I'm trying to think of like, uh, some of the silly numbers that I've seen. Um, you, you could about imagine what double meaning certain numbers uh, have out there. Well, um, I have a pretty special card. It's a uh, Sven Coombs number 69. There you go. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I mean, would you rather have that than another number 68? I, I guess. <laughs> Absolutely. I would rather have the one that I have. But you need sure one more other things like that. Yeah, I haven't been in the weeds enough to know kind of some of the. I, I just know they're out there, like the, you know, like the, like the age thing, the birthday thing, the draft round, um, jersey. What else is there? Just the double well, meaning of the numbers. What we've recently seen in so rare is you know with uh, Enzo Perez is the special card that they made when he played goalkeeper. He's holding up a thumbs up with his goalkeeper gloves on. So it, anything that's different i think is kind of key right yeah i think so rare should do more of that too that I, we talked about that before the podcast briefly it's I, I hadn't seen that until you mentioned it i thought that was really cool because the cards themselves honestly they are they are a little boring yeah you know it's, it's just the guys like now i assume for licensing reasons you just just have the head like the neck up there's uh, a couple other that are cool like the martin vandervoort uh uh he's like I don't know. It's just like he's got a really cool pose going on, or whatever. He's got his flowing hair. Uh, are you are you gonna pull that up real quick, Andrew? Yeah. <laughs> I think if you wanted to that appeal to as many people as possible, if you look at the Ethereum art community, mm -hmm. which there's a lot of money being spent on, um, you know, those NFTs. It's all about, I guess it's rarity too, but it's all about, well, how do they look? Is it, is it appealing to, to the eye? I guess I, this speaks to me. 
you know, if, if all these so rare cards look the exact same, you're not going to get any of that. But there, if there's cool ones, you know, because they're, they're different and, you know, just have better visual appeal, I think that's a, that's a no brainer. So there's a lot of rumors going around that they're adding some, potentially adding some national team. Uh, like uh, I, I saw the logo uh, of the French national team matches, whatever they were. So if there were some big star players that are in the national team jersey instead of the um, uh, their regular club team jersey, that would be another thing that might be different. You know, you have the international version against the uh, instead of the club version. Are they still auctioning everything like it, like on the primary sale? Is there any way to get one? See, I always thought it'd be fun too, you know, if tie it to the game somehow. So like that, that, that special card, like you were talking about, like, I don't know, you, you, you win that. So it's, it's, so, yeah, it's you, you, it. you can win cards by doing well in tournaments. And then they have a weekly challenge where, um, where you can win a special edition type card, no, a little bit different yeah. design. But yeah, which which of those cards are cooler, right? Yep. Yeah, I, I I think that they're they're missing it without doing more of that stuff. Yeah, because for sure. I agree, the cards are kind of boring. You think they'll ever get like into action shots? Oh, I would love love for them to. You know, you a guy scoring a goal or celebrating or whatever. I mean, there's so many awesome things that they could do with that. Have you, has there been any, like, I don't know, any, any rumors about them doing that? You look at Topps MLB, the photography's phenomenal. You know, they've been doing it for 70 years. Yeah. Um, and I think that would, that would help the collect. We're talking collectability. I, I just think that would help too. Um, there's certain cards that carry a premium just because of, regardless of rarity, just because of the way it looks or it captured a specific moment in time, I guess, that, that people uh, care about. Um, so. So. This uh, screenshot is making me remember one other thing. So, Randy, do you think there's any value in previous owners of an NFT? Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, didn't Gary V start buying some of these? So Gary V did. I'm scrolling up here. So this Martin Vandervoort card is owned by Antoine Griezmann right now, who plays for Barcelona. And I've seen people who have bought cards from him try to sell them specifically with the, hey, Antoine Griezmann owned this card once is I, I kind of get it if it was a physical item and like, they like touched it. he touched it yeah, and like he did something with this. I, I'm not sure I'm feeling the same thing with an NFT, but. Would you want to you know? own Mark Cuban's first NBA top shot? I, I would, I think there's plenty of people with just like as a, yeah. or, Really, there. I mean, think of all the different places you could go with that. And, and this is something on Crypto Slam because it's, uh, you know, we're dedicated to providing transparency to all this, you know, and we would love to expose more of that. So if there was, you know, a, 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 a you know, a, a famous athlete who owned this, this card at first, it, that needs to be visible better. You know, to where you don't have to go and dig and bury it. But what if it was front and center, and you and you knew that this was, you know, so and so's so and so owned this card, um, and maybe it's the first one he ever he ever owned. Um, you know, or uh, one thing that's pretty cool is we do have a lot of a lot of the players that uh, actually uh, play the game that that are in the game. So, like, I don't know if you want to pull a card up real quick, Andrew, of somebody that has has a signed card. They have a, a player card, um, where it's actually an autograph card by the by the player. Um, some of those are pretty cool. Um, I think they can do more with it, though. Um, like, what if what if I were to trade Vanakin? If I were to send him my Vanakin, if he could sign it and then send it back to me, like that's the type of stuff that I think would be really cool. But you see the signature. That would be awesome. Somebody's going to figure that out before long, I would think, and then have it be like, like a, you know, like the Twitter check mark, you know, so you know it's authentic, and and you know you got this authentically signed NFT. I, right, I and they actually do have the check mark on those guys' accounts. You can see that they're verified accounts, and yeah, HV twenty, you got the green check mark. You know that it's him. So would you know though? Okay, yeah, I got gotcha. you. So we know he's on the platform and they give him his card to sign. 
See, I'm saying these things that would be cool. So rare already has it. You know, it's like I, I told you they've been one. They've one good decision after another. Um, in, in my opinion, you saw it from the very beginning. You know, just building it for the long term. I, I, yeah, and I feel like they're kind of just kind of like testing their their feet in some of this stuff. They're not going full bore. Um, I think some of it they're ready to to really start pushing forward and 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 going harder on. But a lot of it, I think, is really they're just testing the waters. Uh-huh. Well, they could do what the moment think? thing too. Like, what what says these have to be cards even to have utility? It could be a a video clip of somebody scoring a goal. Yeah, I, I think there's going to be more of that coming with with other sports. What I would like to see more, I think, is is tie that to the gameplay, and you know, uh, look look at the score for your player and you can click on the score and it might show you the highlights from the game. So if Lewandowski scored hundred points, I click on the score and I can see his three goals that he scored in, the, in that particular game. I think that that it would be the way I visual, I would visualize like moments getting tied to so rare. Sure. Yeah. I think the biggest issue there, and that's not something we have to go into is let just like media rights Absolutely. for a company that, markets itself as available in every single country. Yeah. And soccer is notoriously very un-international when it comes to their, to their media rights. Sure. But I think that's actually part of the reason why we won't see action shots or even basically moments anytime soon. Maybe the action shots, they come from the clubs, but I don't know. I think that's why we end up getting a lot of these just boring media day or picture day cards because that's what they get from the club. They wouldn't have to do it for all of them. Just, just get it for like one, one club, you know, that's true. Um, and, and just to the point about collectability, then it could be like a special thing that, you know, you would, you would collect, I guess. What would you, what would you need to see from so rare to, for you to like really jump in or do you just not, do you need need another five hours in your day? (laughs) Honestly, I would say, I don't know if this is going to be popular, but get off Ethereum. I just, I think it's just bad for, uh, bad for a game. Just um, due to transaction fees. Yeah, like. Uh, so, real quick, if they if they go to layer two or something, that's still quote unquote on Ethereum. It's just using uh, a scaling technology, which. I think it accomplishes the same goal. Yeah, and I think it's 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 uh, the jury's still out on whether a layer two is better or better than or as as good as um, these these blockchains. And I'm thinking Wax and Flow in particular that were built, um, you know, I guess a little bit later on. And you know, because like the layer twos, it's like they were built to solve a problem, you know, with Ethereum, and they sit on top of Ethereum and you know, transactions largely have to still settle on Ethereum. But what if, what if they didn't? What if it could all just be nice and neat on 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 one chain? And I just I just feel I like mean, what if it could all just be in one big database, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, which is an ideal because it's kind of against the whole idea of decentralization. And that's why I mean that's why there's a lot of hate towards Flow for being kind of more either more centralized or there's yeah. less secure, I guess. Yeah, I would I would hope that flow becomes, you know, more uh, um, I don't know, like a like a blockchain. Like yeah. you can't you can't go to Crypto Slam and connect your Dapper wallet like you can with Ethereum and, and, and Wax yet. You know, we're told that's coming, but we've been told that's coming for a while. Um, but you know, you see all the stuff flow's doing, they're gonna get there. That they've yeah. got to. Otherwise, what's the point? MBA top shop moments are just all sitting in a database somewhere is disguised as a blockchain. They're going to have to do that. Um, but, but yeah, I just, I just think, um, you know, Ethereum has been around forever. It just wasn't, it just wasn't built for this kind of stuff. Um, and so rare done a, done a good job of, of making do, you know, if you look and I haven't checked in a while, but you would see like, I would know, I would like wake up and I check crypto slam stats and I'd be like, shoot, you know, there's no so rare sales. You know what, what, what's wrong? You know what, what's screwed up that I have to go fix now. Yeah. And I would forget that. Well, so rare sales occur within their system and then they settle them on the blockchain in, in batch. 
I honestly, I, I assume they're still doing that. Maybe they're not, but at, for a long period of time, they were. And so uh, if gas tended to be really high and they were trying to wait it out, they would go and then settle it all at once. And then so right. I'd, I'd remember that and be like, oh, shoot, this wasn't something we had to fix. So just think of like that kind of workaround, um, you know, that they had to do um, just just because of the, just because of the blockchain. Um, you know, and I'm getting to be honest, I, I haven't had a ton of experience with the other layer twos out there. You know, we're, we're definitely going to get to know Matic a lot better uh, or for sure Polygon, whatever it's called, uh, just because of, uh, you know, we got we're supporting it and it's coming out. So I'm curious to see how that works. So I, I'm open uh um, I'm open to that. There might be a better option than, than wax or, or flow right now. Um, and there's a lot of innovation. There's all kinds of, all these blockchains want a part of NFTs right now. Um, and just to, to, to think that Ethereum, just because they were first is ultimately going to be the one that is the winner. Um, because there were some of these bandaid layer twos thrown on top of it. Um, I don't know. Maybe. I call them innovations. Yeah, it's it's fun. And, and we're in like, in, we're in the, I feel like crypto slams in the middle of all this, like in the middle of the blockchain wars, they're all like fighting for, you know, fighting for all this attention. And, and you know, we're just kind of sitting in the middle of it. It doesn't really matter what I think. We're going to track it either way. Um, I, I think um, something's going on with Matic though, uh, Polygon. Um, that's, that's, I, I want to experience it myself just because I, I think it's going well. Um, just from the, from the buzz I've heard. And I'd be curious. Yeah. With so rare has done just a really good job making do. I, I, I am curious what they're doing with their roll-ups and how that would, you know, but back, back to your, your question was what, what needs for me to jump in? I would just say it's gotta be easier to transact and not have to deal with the fees and have it be more instant. And, yeah. you know, I want them to trade, uh, not just in, in the so rare marketplace, but I want them to trade, uh, on, um, Open sea on crypto slam someday, uh, you know, at, outside of outside of there, you know, right. you that interoperability. And you can certainly do that now. It's just expensive because you have to pay. Yeah, gas. like it have it be more yeah. native, I guess. Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I think that that's I think that's the goal of uh, Ethereum and the Ethereum uh, whatever they call them now, the Ethereum organization or whatever they're they're working on. You know, these side chains they they. They're working on proof of stake. There's a lot of good innovation, I feel like. Um, and I would rather have a good, secure, decentralized network than to sell myself short on a uh, glorified database that's kind of controlled by one en entity. Do you think most people it's, 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 care? It's most people don't care. You're right. Most people yeah. do not care. They just want their thing and they want it cheap and they want it whatever. I think they will eventually. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. It's, it's going to need all of that. And, but, but, but also not have the transaction fees and. Yeah. You know. hmm. Yeah. I guess, I mean, like I have no blockchain or crypto experience before so rare. Um, and I don't feel like, I don't feel like being on so rare has made me, any sort of blockchain expert, but it's partly because I don't have to deal with it at all other than yeah. depositing, which that's a, the best thing, thing I would say is, is you don't care until you need to care. You know, you lose your thing and somebody right. takes it or it, uh, uh, so rare disappears and they say, okay, we're going to confiscate all of the, the, you know, the things or, you know, flow were to do something like that and just say, hey, you know what, we messed up. We're taking all these back because we um, we minted them incorrectly and we didn't mean to, to, to sell them. We're taking them back. Um, that's when you care. When that's they, when I care. If somebody okay. were to do something like that. You don't care until until you do. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh, cool. And do you have any other questions? I think we covered everything that was on my list. Did we hit any of the Twitter questions? Uh, I feel like we sort of did. Yeah, um, I think the big question was mostly along the lines of, yes, we know Ronaldo, Messi, uh, Mbappe, they're going to be collectibles in 20 years. That Those cards are cool. They're Hall of Fame cards. 
Will a somebody said Bresson? Um, will a random player in the MLS will he be collectible in ten years? Absolutely. And, go 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 to go to eBay. You know, in, in nineteen fifty two tops. So like the first and 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 pick like some player you've never heard of. Are they worth anything? You know, is it is Mickey Mantle worth more? Obviously, but but yeah. so are the other ones. And you know, if if you're betting on so rare, which I think is a pretty good bet. You know, I think any of these just, you know, these we're still so early and there have not been a lot minted. I, I think any of them are, are a good bet. Yeah. Also being better bets than others. And, you know, I didn't really think about this, but, you know, we have, you have the, the slippage or the, the deletion of cards where, you know, uh, you got a pack from your grandma back in, you know, a long time ago and you played with the card or you ripped it up or you put it in your uh, bike and it made, you know, to, to make sound or whatever. And, you know, the cards got destroyed. That will happen. in so rare where people like just disappear and they forget about their account and they don't want to play anymore and they just poof, go away. And these cards just kind of vanish. Right. You know? um, so to think that, you know, there'll always be a hundred from that year, you know, or if there were a hundred minted, I mean, there's going to be people, I mean, hell, there might be people that die and then, you know, their so rare collection just goes with them. Yeah. There's a difference between supply and I don't know, circulating supply, I guess, to, to use to pull yeah. from, you know, other tokens, you know, some of them will just inaccessible and will never, uh, won't ever factor into the supply demand equation. Yeah is the price just because they're not out there yeah that's a good point because i've definitely tried to get cards from people who clearly gave up on so rare months ago and it's like those cards may as well not even like you said in circulation because they're gone yeah oh well he's not responding to your offers laird no <laughs> <laughs> they were good offers come on <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right um once again randy wassinger from crypto slam thank you so much for coming on that was uh that was really great. We, uh, I think we touched on all the questions that we had for you because um, it was nice that you are obviously familiar with Sober, but not on it specifically, but you're very deep in NFTs. So it was kind of just the, uh, just the, the uh, look that we were looking for. So thank you very much for coming on. Yeah, thanks um, for having me. Had a lot of fun. Yeah. And uh, once again, this is the Sober Andrews podcast brought to you by Rotowire. Uh, Andy and I will be back next week with a new topic. So uh, if there's anything you want us to cover that we haven't already, Feel free to reach out to us. You can find me uh, on Twitter at Rotowire Andrew and is at ablack86. So uh, hit us up there and we'll talk to you next week. Try Rotowire today, free for 10 days. Get our premium tools, rankings, analysis, and breaking news alerts. No credit card required. Go to rotowire.com forward slash try.